You're listening to WCAT Radio, your home for authentic Catholic programming. Welcome back to WCAT's, what are we? Oh, the Catholic Bookworm. <laughs> it's like, what name did we decide on? Um, Thank you. It's so, um, this is David Hyduck with us today. And David, why don't you start us with a prayer? Sure. And, can, um, we, can we restart? Can we just restart? Sure. The, I had I realized that I had my air conditioner on. I had to turn it off so that that might have been part of the problem. Now I'm going to be much clearer, right? Yes, you are clearer now. Yeah, so that was what the sound was. I had forgotten that I left that on. So why don't we, okay. why don't we start again? <laughs> All right. Uh, welcome to WCAT's The Catholic Bookworm. I have with me today again, David Hyduck. Welcome back. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. David is the author of Healing the Culture and the Family. Is that correct? I got that title correct. I'm yeah. terrible with titles. <laughs> yes. Thank um, you. So welcome back. Um, why don't you start us with a short prayer and then we'll have a hopefully great fruitful discussion. Wonderful. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord God, we ask you to send your Holy Spirit to animate us and inspire us and to speak through us. And because as the spouse of the Blessed Virgin Mary, we know that the Spirit acts in unity with the Holy Virgin and she with him. We pray, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. Well, for those of you who were here for our first interview or haven't accessed it yet, David has written Healing the Culture and the Family, in which you discuss the old Manichaeism and then the new Manichaeism. We spent a lot of time discussing those concepts. Um, do you want to just briefly discuss the, what we you mean by the new Manichaeism? So, because what we want to do today is really talk about the ramifications of that in the culture and how we find it in the culture, where we see it, under what conditions, um, where we bump into it um, on a more sure. practical level. Great. So um, this is the book. Backwards. Ah, I haven't seen it. <laughs> I've read it, but I haven't seen it. I've read it online. Actually, I was very, very, very pleased Um you probably have heard of Michael O'Brien, the author and painter, artist, Catholic author and painter. He's written like Father Elijah and the whole series of books that are published by Ignatius Press. So the cover art is from him, and he graciously agreed to allow us to use that image, which is really very beautiful. Um, Can we see it again? Can you hold sure. it up? I don't know if it's going to be in the right direction. Can you see this? That's good. Oh, well, that's beautiful. And, it, and what's unique is that it has the a young Jesus, but more like the the preteen teenager Jesus holding the Holy Spirit, the dove. And you don't often see pictures of the Holy Family with the, and the older Christ, but still a child, right? Yeah. So uh so I think that's really interesting. And there's also the there's three crosses in the background and the sun shining. So there's a lot of different wonderful images in that picture. But yeah. um, so in any in any event, I just wanted to give, you know, Mr. O'Brien a shout out because it was very yeah. gracious of him to allow us to use that image. So um, I had discussed in this, the reason why it's called healing the culture in the family is because uh, I believe that what John Paul II did specifically in his letter to families is identify the quote unquote heresy or spiritual disease of our time as a new Manichaeism. And the book illustrates what he meant by that um, new Manichaeism and, and where it comes from. Um, and then tries to establish that he structured his very um, anthropology, his way of, of expressing and articulating what it means to be a human person and uh, and also obviously flowing from that, uh, his teachings on on love, on marriage, on sexuality, on being a uh, man and woman um, as a response to this spiritual disease, as a remedy or an antidote. So that's uh, where the title Healing the Culture and the Family, according to John Paul II, comes from. Um, 
So what is the new Manichaeism? Well, very, very briefly, uh, he doesn't necessarily say that it is a uh, like somehow directly in line with the old Manichaeism, as if we saw from Mani of Babylonia in the 200s, you know, some kind of throughout history and now today, this new manifestation of this ancient um, Gnostic dualistic uh, religion. Uh, but what he does is use this term analogously. And in fact, it was used analogously in Christian history. I mean, even though you might see some who try to draw a direct line between the Manichees of Babylonia and like the Cathars or the Albigensians in the Middle Ages, uh, the reality is that like the term Manichaeism was applied to any group whose doctrines were similar to, in a variety of ways, what Manny taught. So it, it wasn't meant to be like somehow there was a direct connection or a resurgence right. of that religion. Mm -hmm. And so I think John Paul II is using the term that way, analogously, to refer to certain aspects of contemporary ways of thinking and acting that um, are similar to Manichaeism, ancient Manichaeism and medieval Manichaeism. So, uh, but he sees that as associated with the philosophical turn associated with um, the 17th century philosopher René Descartes. Uh, so, so basically what I'm doing is, is showing how he sees this new Manichaeism as flowing from Descartes and from modern rationalism that, that followed from Descartes um, and making its way into Western civilization and culture, just the way we think and act, especially post-Enlightenment, which Descartes' ideas really had a major influence on. And, uh, and how that changes the whole way we see ourselves and the world around us. Um, and even how we judge what's right and what's wrong. Mm -hmm. So uh, what I do is ident I identify four aspects of Descartes' philosophy that can be labeled neo-Manichaean. Um, and that John Paul II identifies, particularly in his letter to families, but elsewhere. And then uh, those four are anthropological dualism, um, a mechanistic view of nature, the rejection of uh, the notion of creation, uh, particularly associated with St. Thomas Aquinas' philosophy of being or essay, and then a tendency towards relativism and utilitarianism in ethics. So those are the four components you could say, or let's say symptoms of this spiritual disease called uh, a new Manichaeism that John Paul II through his own writings is trying to uh, remediate. So to start with, we have this separation of body and spirit that we see everywhere. Um, taking care of the body and taking care of the spirit are two separate things very often. Um, even within church, things. I'm seeing it everywhere now. Um, it's certainly a new age concept um, associated with it, you know, that the spirit is what matters. Um, you know, I will become an angel. <laughs> um, those I concepts, am my consciousness. So to speak. I am my consciousness. All that matters really is my consciousness. Um, and then, of course, the use of the body, therefore, you know, what's if what's important is my soul, then I can do whatever I want with my body. It's just kind of an add on. Um, and we certainly see that um, we can also dispose of bodies where we decide the soul doesn't matter or it's not there. Or maybe you want to add on to some of that. Um, so where do you see it most in the culture? Tell me that the places where you see it extremely problematic. Yeah, well, I think one of the, the areas in which John Paul II really focused on were, of course, the areas of bioethics and sexual ethics. Um, but he focused on others, too. Uh, so I think first starting with, you know, bioethics, the whole argument for abortion is very dualistic in the sense that, um, for example, when you when you talk to people about uh, whether or not the unborn is a baby, they, they they'll often say, "Well, it's not a baby; it's just a blob of tissue." You know, like so. It's like really, you like that's okay. And and then of course you want to say to them, "Well, if you're looking at it from a purely materialistic standpoint, what are any of us but merely blobs of tissue?" But like you know, if you're going to go with that sort of idea, 
right? Right. Um, It's interesting. The abortion issue was the first time from what I've read and heard that human being and human person were separated. Yes. Very distinctly. Yes. Well, this is also a very interesting thing, right? So like, and this is the main point. Um, when, when you wrongly identify, let's put it this way, all, all questions of ethics are really first and foremost questions of anthropology. And ethical errors are going to flow often from anthropological ones. Um, so, so in this sense, ethics follows ethos. You know, <laughs> like um, that, that, that what, what I do flows from who I am. And if I have a wrong view of who I am, I'm going to have a wrong view of what I, how I ought to behave and how I ought to act. And also, you know, like, let's, let's put it this way. Like if ethics is how as a human being I ought to act and how as a human being you ought to be treated, well, then if we get the human being wrong, we're going to get it all wrong. <laughs> right? all wrong. Right. And this starts at the very beginning because like if somehow I draw a, a, a separation between this zygote or embryo that I say is merely a blob of tissue, what's often the reason given for a while they'll, why they'll, they'll claim that? Well, because, because it doesn't have consciousness. There, see, this is an exact reason. It's not really a person because it doesn't have consciousness. It doesn't have self-reflection. It doesn't have, you know, even, it, it isn't even able to distinguish itself. Well, in this way, of course, like these sorts of arguments become somewhat silly because, because they would suggest that like a newborn somehow has this ability to separate itself from its environment, which of course we know it doesn't, right? <laughs> you know? Yeah. So um, you have pe- people like Dr. Peter Singer, therefore, who advocate, you know, like infanticide uh, for a certain amount of months, especially for children that are suffering or maybe have yeah. extreme disabilities. And while I think his views are abhorrent and incredibly wrong, I, I praise him for his logical consistency. At least absolutely. He, like, at least yeah. he's, he's like, very consistent. Yeah. You know, at least he's yeah. saying if this doesn't count before you're born, you can't all of a sudden say when they don't have it after they're born that now they're a person. Right. Um, otherwise, they're a person before they're born. Right. Birth so, can't turn you into a person. Right. Yeah. So, so again, while I I am in no way, shape, or form praising Dr. Singer, I'm saying he's one of the few, and he himself will say. You know, let's be logically consistent here, you know, um, and yet somehow people think birth is this miraculous moment. And well, it's been interesting in recent years, there's the concept of, I don't know if you've heard of fourth trimester abortion has come up. Yes. You know, so there's I'm been some to consistency. failed abortions, right? And yeah. that's the, that like this, you can make a decision after the child is born, especially if you were trying to abort the child and the baby lived uh, as to whether or not it should live or die. And this was a political issue, if you remember, not too long ago, because it yeah. came up that I think it was the governor of Virginia had made some crazy statements about, you know, well, we'll keep the we'll keep the newborn uh, comfortable and then we'll have a conversation about what to do with it. It's like, what? <laughs> you know, like, I can't believe we're actually having these sorts of. I know. But but again, it becomes uh, really striking as to how this distinction of body and soul it has become so much a part of our consciousness that in order to follow it through logically, we have to say the most ridiculous things. Um, and yet people are saying the most ridiculous things. Um, so again, when, when the child's an unborn child, they usually say it's not a person if it doesn't have consciousness. And of course, this focuses on a lot of issues. And this is why human experimentation goes as it goes, or even in vitro fertilization, these are you know, with, with a lot of compassion for people who are struggling with infertility, the fact remains that the amount of, of the destruction of life that takes place in these processes, let alone the very fact that the processes themselves turn the person into an object of manipulations and technology. Mm-hmm. But it really only makes sense that we say they're okay if we do not view zygotes and embryos as persons. Right. You know, and why would we not view them as persons and just as biological material? Because we associate personhood almost exclusively with one's consciousness, that their identity is their consciousness. And since embryos don't have consciousness, then they're not persons. And so in our in our book on understanding abortion that I wrote with Stephen Schwartz, um, we talk about that distinction between being a person and functioning as a person. Mm-hmm. 
and the the whole idea i mean consciousness is a main as a is a functioning as a person and the the understanding that you can't begin to function as a person unless you have the being of a person first right. uh, a stone will never start to function as a person a cup will never function as a person so this thing that starts to function as a person um has to be a person to begin with right and this goes back to the i think uh i mean obviously it's a form and function uh discrepancy but but the way in which i would say it is are you the sort of being that has you know rational thought rationality as a as a an, a characteristic of of being that kind of being you know and then you would have to say that yes that as long as embryos are human beings and human beings are the sort of beings that are rational then then embryos are rational at least by way of being that kind of being even if they haven't developed that rationality yet just like you would not say that uh, an infant is less a human being than a college professor mm-hmm. you know i mean that's just because a college professor um has maybe developed their intellect and their rationality uh, in, you might say, a particular way, um, that doesn't mean that they're any more of a human being than anybody else. Of course, the lingo now is they're human beings because their DNA is human. They're not person. Right. So that's where that shift has taken place that's amazing. Right, but see, that that shift is a matter of convenience. Uh, that, that, shift, that shift didn't exist until we needed a reason to distinguish personhood from uh, human personhood from human being. Right, it's a um, very new shift. Right, because the human being is, of course, a person. Right. Um, and, and I would suggest that they use this, again, on the other side of life with regards to bioethics as a consequence. Yes. You know, this same thing is developed, this distinction is developed in order to make it okay to, to euthanize people or to assist them in their suicides. Because somehow now we, we not only define personhood, we distinguish between human being and human personhood. So obviously if somebody is not living the kind of conscious life that people think they should be living, well, we say, you know, we say grandma's not really there. Well, I don't even know what that means. Um, but we say things like that all the time these days, as if somehow that gives us right to just merely uh, get rid of some biological material that is grandma's body. Right. You know? um, <laughs> right. And, uh, and, or to, to even draw a different distinction between, you know, life and quality of life. So now life isn't worth living unless it's a certain quality of life. And, and societies, I assume, can decide what quality of life is a life worth living because while they say this is up to the person to decide whether or not he or she wishes to live or die or have assistance in their suicide. The fact remains that it's still illegal, let's say, for a, an educator to find out from a student that they plan to kill themselves or are thinking of killing themselves and not go to an authority about it. Right. So we view certain lives as worth uh, making sure they don't take those lives. We, cer- we view certain lives as having a certain quality. Mm-hmm. Which is usually, by the way, associated with production, youth, all kinds of things in society. Poverty, happens. yeah, yeah. So it's yeah, like, I mean, so we'll st- we'll stop like a young person from killing themselves, but we won't stop an old person from killing themselves. We won't stop a, a very very sick or disabled person from killing, you know, themselves. So like, you know, you notice those are the ones that it's okay. And when you see those states that have euthanasia laws or assisted suicide laws or countries that do. When they try to, you might want to say, limit their scope, which never really works in practice. And eventually they even change and broaden, which you saw in Canada. They consistently right. like broaden the euthanasia law that they have. The, the fact remains that um, what, what you see is, is the, the scope is always imposed that this is what we believe to be the kind of life that's worth living. So if that's the kind of life that's worth living, you can't let them kill themselves. But if it's the kind of life that we deem as a society or a government or whoever, it's not worth living. Well, then you can help them. You know, like, and again, it just creates this distinction between the body and the person. Um, 
as if somehow well, the setting the of, person free from their ailed body, you know, like kind the of. concept of don't bring an unwanted child into the world is, is a similar thing. If you're unwanted, I can kill you. You know, so um, again, it's a quality of life um, as if, you know, that determines your ability to be allowed to live is being wanted. Right. You know, well, what if somebody that, doesn't want you some year? You know? right. Well, the fact um, is everybody's wanted because God wants them. And I think right. that's, you know, a good you know, starting point in a conversation with people because it's like, you know, that you are wanted. And I don't just mean by your mother or your father. Right. Um, but like, I think another interesting point to bring out in that regard is that we tend to assign dignity to someone based on somewhat arbitrary and subjective points. Um, like, I even thought about this, like, you know, is my value because I was wanted or is my value inherent? Mm -hmm. Well, in a way, society speaks out of both sides of its mouth regarding it. You know, like on, on the one hand, they say, no, you have inherent value. Well, I guess only after a certain point I had inherent value. You know, like, it, it's like, is, is that really possible? So is it possible that I have inherent value? If you're saying fundamentally, you know, my very life depended on my value being something that by was valued by somebody else. My life being something that was valued by somebody else, right. namely right. my mother, right? So like, so I, I think that this is one of those incongruous um, ideas that our, that our culture seems to have. Um, mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't have a certain dignity we give ourselves to our own free choices. I mean, you know, you wouldn't say that like a Mother Teresa and an Adolf Hitler had the same dignity. Well, they don't have the same moral dignity. Right. But they exactly. have the same ontological dignity. Exactly. So this, yeah. they have this, this inherent dignity that they have vir just in virtue of being, because right. being in the good convert and God created them. But, but what they have become, so to speak, you know, in the sense right. of their moral quality right. is determined by their free choices and how they, that's why we talk about like, building character, you know, a person of character is somebody who makes certain choices, you know, like, and, and so I think in this sense, obviously, we can draw that distinction. But even that distinction is predicated on a more formal, a former distinction. Like, when we think about justice based on need versus justice based on merit, I mean, it's a matter of principle in social justice that, that the justice based on need is prior to the justice based on merit, you know, and so, you know, somebody might deserve punishment, um, but we always have to remember it's a person that's being punished, right? Like, you know, uh, you know, and somebody else might deserve the fruit of their labor, um, but somebody else deserves food simply because they're starving and can't provide it for themselves. And so me enjoying the fruits of my labor is somewhat mitigated by that prior justice, you know, and dignity. So I think that like in, in this sort of way, we, we don't also make distinctions that are important to make. And, uh, and so those kinds of conflations, I think, become problematic in culture. So in the, with regard back to the initial separation of body and soul, yeah. you've got it in the abortion biotech areas. Um, obviously, you've also got it in the areas of euthanasia, assisted suicide, and uh, these end-of-life issues. Um, and, and in this sense, you you might even see it back at the beginning of life issues with contraception, whereby, you know, contraception uh, is not of the same uh, moral evil quality as abortion, because you're not destroying a, a person who's already conceived. But, but I, I think this is important, and maybe we don't think about this, through the act of contraception, you're deliberately and intentionally trying to stop the creation not of any old human being, but a particular human being. If, if like, if, if that, let's say, egg is not fertilized by that particular sperm and that particular sexual act, if there isn't an ovum present, well, that's a particular human being whose life has been, you know, you might want to say attacked in advance, <laughs> you know, like, and so you have this sense that, like, contraception is not just a general closeness to life it's a closing to a particular life being conceived you see and so in that sense um you can even argue that that contraception is not only you know obviously against god's plan for sex but is a very anti-life and anti-particular human's life um 
you know, act. And you know who it brought, drew that out a lot was Dr. William May, uh, God rest his soul, who wrote a, a, a very good book called Catholic Bioethics and the Gift of Human Life, which I, okay. I recommend. Interesting. No, I have not heard that. But it makes sense. Yeah. yeah. So what other ways do you see in the culture? Um, well, clearly there's the, in the sexual realm, right? Okay. I mean, so, so when, um, I mean, you, you see this a lot these days that, you know, it's, 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 my, it's my body, my choice is, was at first used for abortion, but it's even used that way in sex with regards to sex. So it's, um, there's a, an, an idea of using my body for the sake of gaining pleasure, that somehow the, the act of, of sexual union or sexual activity can be separated from my person and just becomes an act of my body that, that gains pleasure or gives pleasure. Right. And so, I won't get hurt. Nobody right. will get hurt, right? Or that somehow I can give my body and not give myself, right. you know, that they, which just is not possible if I'm a body soul composite, you know. Right. And I would say that anybody who's really reflective on on their experiences of, of you know, sexual relations outside of, like, the marriage bond um, can can see that, you know, that that I was hurt through this. I gave myself. Um, that, that it wasn't merely just an act of bodies. It was a, a personal act, um, right. you know, uh, and, and of course, you know, I think that this, but this distinction is clear. So what winds up happening in the sexual realm, people effectively become objects of use and uh, yeah. the, the sexual arena is an arena um, in which there is mass manipulation and use and the objectification of the person. And I objectify myself in that as well as the other person. So I allow myself to be treated as an object of use, which is you know, sort of like an attack on my own dignity. And then I'm reducing mm-hmm. the other person to an object of use. Mm-hmm. And this is, by the way, to connect it back to contraception, of course, this is something John Paul II saw that in contraception, you, know, you not only have an anti-life act, you have an anti-love act because effectively what you're doing is turning the sexual act from an act of self-giving into an act of pleasure seeking, whereby the other person becomes merely uh, an object of sexual pleasure and the two become a partners in an erotic experience, you see? Um, And so contraception fundamentally changes the act. Um, and, And so he saw that as being very obviously um, contradictory of the very nature and purpose of, of love, of, of the sexual act, not only as pro-life, but pro-love, right? So, um, so here is a question. So you have a, two people in this erotic partnership where it seems to be on some level benefiting the body. They're getting erotic pleasure, but just just wreaking havoc on the soul. And yet we want to say I am my body on this deeper level. So why does it seem that there's a difference there? Like, how would you explain that difference? Well, I mean, again, I think this is also a split between the body and the, and the self. But let me, let me say this. That I think um, if I could just take maybe like, thousands and thousands of years step back. Um, you know, like um, the Adam and Eve in the garden, I think went from having an experience of the body soul unity before sin to a disintegration of themselves. And therefore this conflict in their body soul unity as an experience after sin. Mm-hmm. And John Paul II draws this out in the theology of the body. Mm-hmm. But like, I think one of the, one of the main things that's, that really is a, a focal point for him is this idea of, of prior to sin, Adam and Eve being um, without shame, naked, but without shame. Mm-hmm. And then after sin, still being naked, <laughs> but being ashamed and having to cover up. Um, they realized they were naked and they covered up. Now, this is an interesting thing. Obviously, the nakedness hasn't changed, right? Right, right? What has changed is their way of seeing themselves and one another. And in fact, John Paul II reflects that, that perhaps right. even the covering up 
shame has a positive value in the sense that it recognizes that I shouldn't be looked at in a particular way. So there's this. There's I'm this vulnerable echo. now. Exactly. I'm vulnerable. There's yeah. this echo of the original body soul unity in the heart of the person. They know that the, that they are their body, or their body is a body that expresses a person, even though they're not merely their body. If their body is a body that expresses a person, and in that sense, is them. So um, I think that like this is powerful because what it means is that. We're still experiencing, although, you know, those of us who've been baptized, received grace of God, sanctifying grace, we're growing, hopefully in sanctification, we still experience as a part of our nature concupiscence. We still experience this fundamental conflict you know, of body and soul. And so we can fall prey to that and seek to give pleasure to the body, thinking we're deriving pleasure, only to realize that that we've actually brought harm to ourselves. And, and of course there could be harm to the body that's brought. I mean, you could think about, you know, sexually transmitted infections, all these kinds right. of things that can happen as a result of, you know, sexual promiscuity and the like. But the fact that like those choices actually affect me in my soul right. uh, and do not bring the happiness that I seek, but right. rather uh, bring a greater emptiness right. um, well, that's that conflict. I had this physical experience of pleasure, but it was short lived. Right. You know, and, and that then, and that that hurt and loneliness that comes out of it not only affects the soul, but eventually also affects the body. Yes. Because you're yes. when you feel lonely and hurt, your body doesn't feel good either. No, so absolutely. it you know, yeah. So it's so there you also also what you could say is that sexual pleasure of the body is heightened when it is from a, an act of true and total self-giving among the, the spouses, right? Mm -hmm. so, so there's that consequence too. This is why the idea that somehow, um, I, I mean, sometimes you hear this, like you know, somehow sex with only one person for the rest of your life, well, gee, how boring would that be? You know, like, and, <laughs> and it's like, no, actually, um, first of all, if it's the total giving of yourself, every time you give yourself <laughs> You're still the same person, but your shared experiences as a couple have grown. The things you've been through have grown. All that stuff has grown. And so that only enriches that total self-giving. The more, the more life shared together has been experienced, the, the greater and more enriched is, the, is the, the giving of oneself totally in the sexual act, if that has gone about in the way it's supposed to be, you know, like in a true act of total self-giving um, and receiving of the other. But but even beyond that, that the experience of pleasure in the body is going to ex is going to grow as the sexual act brings about the unity by which it was supposed to bring about spiritually, right? right. And so, in this sense, there is there is also that connection between body and soul, you know, and and and. This is why I think I think study after study proves that like people who have been uh, involved in a long term marriage, you know, monogamous relationship, uh, that their their experience of sexual pleasure is uh, really incredible. In, 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 in excuse me a second. I'm sorry. I'm in a meeting right now. I'm sorry. Can you hang on? Hello. <laughs> Well, David's taking a quick child break. I'm taking a ginger tea break. And uh, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> the five-year-old. Urgent. <laughs> Urgent. Yes. Oh, that's lovely. Sorry about that. All you well, Where was real that? life. Was <laughs> oh, yeah. So I think, I think there's, I was, I think if I sounded incoherent at the end of that, it's because I kept hearing the door getting knocked on. <laughs> so thing you was, know you'd have somebody divided. calling behind you. <laughs> So, uh, so anyway, um, I think study after study shows that like, you know, people who are involved in, in a, a marriage relationship um, and have, you know, obviously this long term commitment, this real commitment to each other, that, that their, um, the, the, the statistics on their sexual pleasure and satisfaction are, are enormously high, you know, like, as, as by the way, is the same with regards to people who have 
waited to have sex before they were married and talk about mm-hmm. their sexual experiences within marriage. You know, like but you're certainly in an environment of safety, you know, to begin with. Um, and this is, of course, not to say that people can't use one another within marriage and that everybody that that the the sacrament of marriage or the actual experience of being married <clears throat> is is sufficient to guarantee this, because this is something right. that we all have to work at mm-hmm. uh, and purify our own motives and intentions, and, mm-hmm. you know, grow in the virtue of chastity in marriage as well. So, I mean, but it does shows why cohabitation is not a great idea of sort of trying somebody out for a year or six months, and we'll see how we do living together. Well, this is know, also so, a great point because it brings up the yeah. same connection that you were talking about before. Like, think about what's communicated there. Effectively, you know, you're an object for me, and when I no longer need you, then you get discarded. Right. <laughs> like, so, so we, we <laughs> it's turn not our, working out. <laughs> exactly. So our neo-Manichaean culture that results from this neo manichaeism this new Manichaeism, effectively becomes a culture in which persons are used the same way things are. Mm-hmm. And cohabitation or serial cohabitation, which is actually really common, is itself a, 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 an expression of that wrong way of thinking. And again, a wrong view of the human person leads to wrong ways of behaving. You know, if you have your anthropology wrong, you're going to have your ethics wrong, right? Yeah. And so this, and so, but people don't even realize their anthropology is wrong. And so they don't realize that their ethics is wrong, except that they're suffering from it, you know, from the experience of pain or alienation or whatever else that they're experiencing. Um, but this is, this is also one of the reasons why, um, I think it's a good reason to express why marriage is actually the m- most compatible idea with regards to the human person because if the human person is the sort of being that must never be used as a mere means and toward whom the only adequate attitude is love which is what uh, saint john paul ii wrote when he was carol voitiwa in his work love and responsibility that's called the personalistic norm if if the person is not ever to be an object of use but only to be have an attitude of love shown towards them well then then I can't have a relationship, like I can't have conditions on marriage or I can't have serial marriages. Marriage has to be till death do us part because effectively what I'm saying is I am for you. I love you for you, no matter what, Mm -hmm. no matter what happens in life, no matter, you know, like how things change, no matter all these sorts Mm -hmm. of things, you know, like, and in this way, it's the ultimate affirmation of the inherent value of the person. It's the ultimate affirmation saying that, that I am for you. If, if it's I am for you unless, you know, you start looking like this or I am for you unless you lose your job and you don't have money anymore. I am for you unless, you know, those little habits that I think are really cute now start to irritate me after 15 years. Or, you know, like I, I am for you. Like, you know, it's like, you know, it's like and we all we understand what I'm talking about. We're laughing because on some level it's. We oh are, yeah yeah right but the fact is if it were then the entire relationship is always you might want to say under suspicion there's this cloud of suspicion when am i going to do the thing that is the last thing you see mm-hmm. that they're no longer for me right and so in this yeah. sense for richer yeah. for poorer and sickness and in health and good times and in bad till death do us part is like the guarantor of the person's dignity right Yeah, I was just talking with a young couple recently. I've been struggling a little. And I said, well, you know, the reason that's the reason you took marriage vows, you know, because if if someone was always easy to love and always easy to hang in there with, you wouldn't need a vow. And they had never thought of that. (laughs) Now, one thing that's come to my attention recently is... um, I was speaking with the director of right to life here in Rhode Island. And he was saying, um, I believe it was Barth Bracey that, you know, the, the abortion rate is dropping, the pregnancy rates are dropping. And one of the reasons for that is that the amount of sex people are having is dropping Mm. Um, primarily because young men are preferring pornography to relationships. They're yeah. seeing a, a huge wave of this. Um, well, of course, you know, pornography is another another uh, terrific, and what I mean is terrific, meaning 
terrifying, terrible, uh, you know, like an example of the, the body soul split and the, a mechanistic view where the body is something I use. I mean, the body is something I use for money. Um, the body is something I use to just look at somebody else's body. Nobody thinks about the life and person of the people they're looking at, you know, on a screen, mm -hmm. you know, right. like um, there's, <clears throat> it's an incredible uh, separation and disconnecting depersonalizing of the body. And I would say, you know, by the way, a really simple definition of lust is when we dis depersonalize someone's body, yeah, right? right. Um, so yeah, and, and unfortunately, this is like now becoming, I mean, it's so pandemic and, and so uh, the addiction to pornography is huge. So much so that like people in the secular sphere are speaking out about how it's destroyed their lives. People that you would never expect would speak out about how pornography has had such a negative effect effect on them um but yeah because you as a person are competing with something that's just a pure body and, right. and an airbrushed body too yeah, well and not only that like talk about your expectations for what sex should be i mean right. you're talking about video that is being looped you know like and right. and so like you know when when somehow you know the sexual experience isn't it doesn't add up to what it looks like it is on the screen. Somehow right. a person can feel very, um, you know, I can lose self-confidence and feel very much like they're, they're somehow not adding up. Right. right. Unfortunately, I think that, that this is, this has an impact on men, but it has a very big impact on women in the sense that women especially feel like they're competing with oh, yeah. what, what the men are seeing on, on pornography. Not um, only not feeling like they're competing, knowing they can't compete. Right, exactly. You cannot compete with an airbrushed, you know, perfect thing. <laughs> but it even is creating like a sense of pressure in women about the sort of sexual acts they should feel comfortable doing. Oh, that's Because true. Of, the, of the sexual acts that are being witnessed by the men and right. therefore then become the expectation of the men when they're right. involved in a sexual relationship. So sometimes what you have these days is almost a flight from femininity because of what is viewed in the culture as being feminine. The more femininity is associated with sexual power and somehow women are convinced that they should be comfortable with all of these various expressions of sexuality and somehow, you know, they should be just like men in that regard, you know, as far as their sexual aggressiveness and forwardness and all that sort of thing. Um, then women are growing up in that culture saying, well, I don't want that, mm. you know? And, mm. and sometimes I wonder if that's not underneath some of <coughs> the struggle that we see today among a lot of young girls. I, I don't know if you know this, but originally the experience of trans, uh, of gender dysphoria or gender identity disorder was predominantly men. Um, who experienced a uh, gender identity disorder and thought they were women. Um, it was very minute in women. And yet, if you look at the explosion of gender dysphoria and transgender um, circumstances, it's almost, the explosion is predominantly among women. Um, and, and that's a really interesting thing because what you see is like, why, when there was practically no women who were really experiencing this, and there were very, very few men, do you obviously have more men experiencing this, but an incredible surge in the amount of women? And, uh, and there have been some studies on that, like, you know, to say that, like, well, this has become something, this, you might want to say, transgender moment has become akin to um, other sorts of experiences of body dysmorphia that have been experienced by women. Um, like for example, bulimia or anorexia. Um, but on the other hand, you have it being in a very sexualized manner, right? And so right. is it, it, what was really found is that like, it's not so much that if you were to do surveys of women who um, had this experience of gender dysphoria, that they wanna be men. It's just, they don't wanna be women. Now, why would that, that be in our culture that they wouldn't wanna be women? Um, because what's being sold to them as what it means to be a woman, especially in the sexual sphere. Yeah. So, you know, again, I'm not, I'm not <laughs> saying this as a definitive sociological, you know, scientific evidence. I'm, I'm speculating, 
based on some of these facts that, that have been found to say, yeah, when you look at how so many women also, it's like pornography is not just a, a male issue anymore. It's a, it's a woman's mm-hmm. issue too, yeah, who struggle with addiction. Issue. But certainly women are competing or know they can't compete with mm-hmm. what men are seeing. And on top of that, um, they're, they're, they're told they should feel comfortable with what they see there as far as how they should be behaving. And yet all of that runs very counter to the, the dignity and nature and genius of femininity, right? So yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, I don't know if that makes sense, yeah. but transgenderism is another place where you have this body-soul distinction because somehow even the very statement, I'm a, you know, I'm a woman trapped in a man's body or I'm a man trapped in a woman's body seems to indicate that there's a distinction between my person, my identity and my body. You know, and that the body isn't me, and it's the body that's got to change, right? Um, so anyway. I always find it interesting that people talk about that, you know, I don't, I don't feel like a woman on the inside, or I don't feel like a man on the inside, my soul. But how do you know what everyone else feels like? Yeah. Yeah, you know that yeah, exactly. That's a very good point, of course. Um, yeah. But and, and I get it. And again, this is in all these cases, I have tremendous compassion for people who are struggling. Oh yeah, you know, they get it. So so in no way do I do I mean to demean their right. their self experience. It's it's tragic to me that that's something that they're going through. And but we should be asking the question: Why are they experiencing that instead of rushing to a conclusion? Oh, they're right about themselves. Um, and because if their body is something else. Well, then our faith teaches us they're not right about themselves. Um, I, I don't know. Have you ever seen the movie The Danish Girl? It was a very well done movie. Um, and it's, a, it's based on a true story. And I, I found it fascinating because he starts out very normal and very happy in his sexuality. He's married. Um, they, he's in love with his wife. He has a beautiful relationship with her. They have a beautiful sexual relationship. They're very, very happy. And she's a seamstress. And one day she needs a model because she's got to quickly make this dress for some rich lady. And the woman she's making the dress for is about the same size as her husband. So she says to him, would you mind, you know, she says, I hate to ask you, but would you mind putting this dress on so I can do the hem? And she does, and he says, sure, of course I'll help you. And he likes the feeling of the dress. That's the beginning of it, is that he's wearing a woman's clothing and he likes it. And that just sends him down this weird path Mm -hmm. where eventually he identifies as a woman and wants to become a woman. And I believe had the first... um, Yeah, I've heard of that case for sure. Um, I've heard of that case for sure. And I've also, uh, I know of the movie, though I haven't seen the movie. Um, What was always interesting in the movie to me was that originally he was happy and fine with his sexuality. And then this weird thing happened um, that kind of just turned something. Um, So, And whatever the case may be, this um, this is not something that's beyond the possibility of the human experience in the sense that we are broken, you know, we right. are fundamentally disordered that right. concupiscence is something in us. And right. it's, it's, it's not something that, that is, uh, let's say, you know, be, because somebody struggles with concupiscence, they're not, they're not, so to speak, guilty because they have concupiscence. They have concupiscence as like, you know, part of their right. her, her, hereditary sinfulness, you know, like right. as, as, a, as a disorder in our, our nature. So well, like, we're very fragile. I yes. mean, it shows and you how result, very fragile. I think that, that those, this, um, those disjunctions between our body and soul can be experienced like Adam and Eve in the garden. And so, you know, obviously that should be treated with a lot of tenderness and compassion, but also with truth because, um, because it's, it's really only the truth that will set you free. And, and you can't have true love without the truth about what is good for the person. And part of the truth we accept is that, you know, God created us male and female, you know, and, and I would also think, uh, you know, that our people don't tend to think about this, but it's something that's important. You know, when we say we are our bodies, I mean, John Paul II clearly knew this, that like we are our bodies, and we are our bodies as man or as woman, that that is our, our body that 
you know, identifies us as a man or a woman. And sure, the, the people might have the, a, a difficulty in their experience of that, or they're feeling comfortable in that. But that in no way says that they're not a man or not a woman. Um, that that it has its own challenges that deserve a lot of compassion and a lot of help with somebody trying to work through. But like, um, but this idea that all of a sudden, again, we are who we are on the inside means that we're telling people today, well, that's what you think you are, then that's what you are. And your body has to change, right? Mm -hmm. It's a okay. fundamentally right. wrong anthropology. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not good for people. And the thing that they're not talking about, of course, is, you know, the, 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 the large number of detransitioners there are today who have horrific stories. Um, you know, all these kinds of things that, like, you know, when, when society gets into affirming people, what's going to happen, and I think is going to happen, is there's going to be a great tidal wave of people who have been so damaged by uh, even, even a medical community that, I mean, can you think of any other issue where the medical community just, you know, the person comes in and they say, this is what my problem is, and they say, yeah, you're right. You know, like it just, it, with, it, there's, there's nothing. It just right out of the, the block. They're like, yeah, that's what you are. Right. You know, like, and so we not only say you are your consciousness, we say you are what you think about your consciousness. You know, like we know that, that that's somehow <laughs> infallible. It's somehow infallible. Um, and this is all part of this new manichaeism. It's like, of course, the, the results of it in a practical way in our culture but it's all related to it. But look at, you know, these are bioethical and sexual ethical issues. You can even see this, I think, in the sphere of like social justice with regards to, let's say, the rights of workers. You know, like the more and more workers view themselves or are viewed by employers as just a cog in the wheel. And, uh, you know, as a, as a means for the, the, the profit gaining of the corporation or particularly those who are in, in the higher up, you know, echelons of the higher echelons of the, of the company. Well, then that's just them being used for their bodies and the work right. they can produce or being used for their, you know, brains and the work mm -hmm. that can be produced and not really being treated as a person or as a body soul composite, which would demand, by the way, that they have a fair and just wage, which would demand that they have adequate working conditions, but which dem would demand that they have a certain amount of time off that is fair and just, which would demand that they can care for their children and get the kind of wage that enables them to do so. You know, like there's a whole lot of things that viewing the person as a body soul unity as a person who cannot be used right. um, as a means to an end has as a consequence for the way we do business, right? right. So, so I mean, I don't want to say it doesn't have applications to other areas. John Paul II did talk about those in his writings on Catholic social teaching. But, um, and in fact, uh, one of my mentors, Dr. Deborah Savage, who was gracious enough to write the forward to my book, um, she has focused a lot on that. Um, but another thing that I think is good, I, I really, really recommend um, a, uh, you know, she has a lot of great work on this idea of the feminine genius, but also the masculine genius. And she talks about also masculinity and femininity or as gender, uh, as we use that term today, or sex, as um, being a proper accident in the, in the thought of St. Thomas Aquinas, um, which therefore means that although matter, the body is the principle of individuation of the person, that there's actually obviously a particular individual soul that God infuses into the body as a form of individuation with regards to the members of the species. And the body is obviously uh, engendered, male or female, but that because it's a proper accident in the person, it actually has an impact, you know, it's actually related to the soul. And therefore, when the, the person dies and their soul leaves their body, it, their, their soul is engendered, <laughs> you know, like in this, right? So it, it, it actually is a very, very interesting thing to look at. So this. I'll still be a girl in purgatory. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and that particular girl known as Kiki Lab. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> interesting. Yeah, that makes sense. You know, Edith Stein had a, a concept that she, maybe I mentioned this last time, where she believed that women's souls were connected differently to the body than a man's soul. 
but it may be more going. And she never elaborated on that. Um, well, of course, she was a Thomist. So, like, yeah. although she was, although she she's similar to John Paul II, sought a sort of synthesis between the phenomenological method and Thomism. Um, which, by the way, I think that her works on Thomas, looking at it through a lens of phenomenology, are very valuable. Um, you, uh, you mean herself being a, a student of Edmund Husserl, right? Um, <laughs> But it's interesting, I, just this thing, this is a little bit from Dr. Savage, for the sake of the argument. Some accidents result from matter because of its relation to a special form. Examples are male and female among animals, a difference that is reducible to matter, as the metaphysics says. So that's right from Aquinas's On Being in Essence, where he's talking about a, a, um, Aristotle. And so basically, Aquinas uh, further distinguishes two types of accidents, those accidents that do not flow from the essential properties of the species or principles of a species. So like, for example, eye color and hair, hair color, they're accidents that don't flow from the essential properties of being human. Whether you have one or the other, you know, in a sense, um, is irrelevant. But the latter kind are inseparable or proper accidents, an accident that is deemed inseparable or proper because it follows of necessity from the essential principles of the substance. And so gender is an inseparable accident. We are a human being as male or as female. That's different than eye color and skin color. Mm -hmm. So that's very important because what that means is that we are a man or a woman. And while... Um, you might want to say the gender is a proper accent accruing to man on account of matter, but it doesn't reside in matter solely. It, it resides in the composite body and soul. And therefore, when, when the person dies, because this is something dealing with the essential principles of a form, is associated with the form, which of course is the soul. So when the soul separates from the body, then that proper accent is part of the form. So, so that's, some of the work of my mentor, Dr. Savage, on this. And I think her work is really valuable because it shows that this whole question of obviously body, soul is one thing, but then you've got the question of what is the relationship between gender and our bodies and then our souls? And she's answering that question, delving into the works of St. Thomas Aquinas. I think it's, you know, if John Paul II said that the metaphysics, the, the, the teachings of Aquinas, the philosophy of essay, is absolutely essential to get past the Cartesian watershed, and therefore I would say to remediate the new Manichaeism, then all of these things are going to be of help to, to kind of help us to reorient ourselves to a proper view of the person, a proper anthropology that will then lead to a proper way of, of acting. And, and what is the name of her book? That you oh, were this one, to? this is an article that was in Logos, and I think it's called On the Nature and Relation of of man and woman. Um, and, uh, but I, if you looked up Dr. Savage, Savage, man and woman logos, you would I find will. It, that article. It's a very, very valuable article. Very valuable article. Is there anything you'd like to add? We're, we've gone on here about an hour. It's, this is just delightful. I've had so many questions floating around that well, well, you've answered. Um, have I been reminded helpful, I've, I've been helpful that this has drawn a lot of practical Conclusion. So I think the new Manichaeism, once you kind of have that lens, we see there's a rejection of creation as such, you know, creation as given, as something that is um, like a participated likeness in the divine, you know, essay, um, limited by its particular, you know, nature. Um, I think that like what you start to realize is that everything God created with a purpose and, and for a reason with an end. Um, and, and in particular, that's true of all created things. Um, but in the human being who's created specifically in the image and likeness of God, which of course that image of likeness of God is chiefly in the soul, but because of the union of body and soul, the body shares and expresses that image and likeness in the world, which is one of the main things that John Paul II uh, is really emphasizing in the theology of the body. I think that um, you start to see yourself and others differently. Right. right. Um, 
And then the meaning of everything's different. One, I, I, just as a little add on, one of my concerns about the direction of moral theology today is that it has largely rejected John Paul II's Veritati Splendor, it seems, and has gone back in a direction of a conscience based morality. But one of the things that I think is, I hear some rumblings about, is that somehow openness to life itself it should be reconsidered to be primarily something about an intention or attitude. Um, thereby, same-sex couples, for example, who adopt or otherwise have, have children brought into their union could be considered being open to life, you know, um, or couples that are heterosexual that, that use artificial insemination or like just as a means to helping them become <laughs> open to life, that the minute you make open to life an attitude as opposed to associated with certain deliberate concrete acts of the body. Now you've, you've completely blown the doors off of the moral issue, of course, which is problematic in its own right. Um, but I think fundamentally what you've done is you've made an, an anthropological error. Right. Once again, that somehow I act doesn't have something to do with my body. Right. Okay, it's just the soul. Right? It's just, just soul. what it's I just thought. My it's my thought. It's just what I mean. It's just, you know, it's like an intentions based morality. Now, of course, we know that intention is one of the three components of right. the, the ob you know, of the morality of an act, but right. primarily the object is. Right. And the object has to do with what I'm actually doing. <laughs> you know, like right. so. Um, so, yeah, you can. You can take a morally good or neutral object and make it evil by virtue of an evil intention, but you can't take a morally evil object and make it good by virtue of an evil intention, uh, by, uh, by virtue of a good intention. You can't, you know, as I used to say, the road to hell is paved with good intention. So, like, but, you know, so, so but, but this fundamentally big problem in morality or moral theology that is seems to be creeping up again. It was a very 70s idea that was associated with Rahner and Fuchs and Herring and the like. Um, now is becoming, is gaining traction and ground again. And I think in and of itself is a betrayal of the, of the um, body soul unity of the human person, whereby, and I, and I noticed this in, in your book, by the way, with uh, Dr. Schwartz on the, you know, philosophy begins in wonder. You know, um, I, this is an important point that like there's, I act, meaning I am acting voluntarily in freedom. Those are the kinds of acts that are truly, you might want to say personal acts, but I do that in and through what a body, right? you know, right. you know, <laughs> as opposed to acts, which John Paul II would be calling, you know, acts of man or something happens in man, which are involuntary or, as a result of a compromised freedom, right? right. Um, but if I act freely and I do something freely in and through my body, it is I who act in and through my body. And what I do, what I have done with my body, I have done. Right. Uh, so to, to, to try to create a dichotomy between the act I'm doing with my body and me and my intention is fundamentally erroneous yeah. and not Catholic moral theology. So again, like those, those, I think, erroneous moral theologies that make, you know, my intention or what I discern in my conscience, the fundamental thing about um, whether or not an act is morally good or not, right. it, are, are a betrayal of the, of the nature of the human person as God created us. Yep. Mm. So there, I've opened up another can of worms for another day. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but it's a consequence. Oh. <laughs> Well, this has been wonderful, and I'm sure it's been helpful for many who will watch it um, to say, like, how does this play out? You have these philosophical and theological ideas, and then how do, how do we see them? How do they play out in everyday life? You know? yes. and, and like I told you, I bumped into more and more of it in the, in the week following our, our interview. So, um, well, when I was doing my doctoral work, I was accused of seeing the new Manichaeism everywhere. <laughs> so, like, <laughs> and maybe it was everywhere <laughs> do you want to close us with a prayer sure thanks for having me on again Kiki I appreciate Thank it you. in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit Amen 
Oh, Lord Jesus, we just thank you for the gift of our lives. We thank you for creating us in your image and likeness as a body-soul unity. We thank you for, for coming to earth, becoming one of us in order to save us. And so we give you all the glory and may you be praised now and forever as we say glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now and never shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> God bless you, Kiki. God bless. I wanted to mention, I um, Vashon will cut this off, but the gentleman that I um, wrote, um, Philosophy Begins in Wonder and the Abortion Book, he was held by Edith Stein as a baby. Oh. <laughs> she was a friend of the family. So I always tell him he's a fourth level relic. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, um, and, and, and did I did I read that correctly that, that he studied under Dietrich von Hildebrand? He is the godson of Dietrich von oh, Hildebrand. Yeah, yeah. And um so I'm a great the, admirer the of Dietrich von Hildebrand. What's that? I'm a great admirer of Dietrich von Hildebrand. I mean, have you read um his book on the heart? No, I I, I have it. I haven't read it yet, but it's really an interesting <laughs> idea to me. It's um, excellent. Yeah. I'm, I'm look, I'll look forward to it. Of course, I'm in the midst of researching for another book. So like, that's <laughs> one of the things is that you know, there's so many books, so little time. Um, well, the Von Hildebrands, the Schwartzes, the Ratzingers, um, they were all co in connected. And Edith Stein was an atheist when they met her. And her, her, um, her conversion was through her interaction with the von Hildebrands, especially. Well, I've loved but other when books she would... I've read by von Hildebrand. I, I, I utilize um, uh, a lot of his work with my class because I think that he really gives a sense of, of um, you know, understanding our metaphysical situation. Yeah. Uh, he's really, really good at that. And uh, the virtue of humility, of course, you know, he's really wonderful with. And, and I, I don't teach the theology of the body anymore without also assigning in defense of purity, which I think is really informative uh, for properly understanding what John Paul II is trying to say. You know, it's kind of funny. Uh, Alice was always fond of saying that her husband wrote the theology of the body before there was a theology of the body. <laughs> and uh and I always kind of thought that was cute, you know, like that she just loves her husband so much, you know, like, it's like lovely. <laughs> but then I read in defense of purity, I said, uh, wow, like, you know, man, if you, if you look at the trajectory of that work, it's very similar in the triptych view that it has and how it even deals with, you know, celibacy and virginity and all that. So um, I thought it was very, very informative uh, for people to read somebody coming from a similar idea, you know, like Thomism, phenomenology looking at similar issues, um, with, but really, I think, putting it in a slightly different way that helps to clarify some of what John Paul II is saying and meaning, which I thought has helped because some of the popularizing of John Paul II sometimes, I think, misses the much deeper thing he's trying to do and maybe yeah. hyper-sexualizes it. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, like, uh, so, yeah, Von Hildebrand's great for, like, overcoming that. His right. work in, in yeah. defense of purity is yeah. great. Well, thank you. This All right. Wonderful. God bless, Kiki. God bless. All right. Bye-bye. Hello, God's beloved. I'm Annabelle Mosley, author, professor of theology, and host of Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. I invite you to listen in and find inspiration along this sacred journey we're traveling together to make our lives a masterpiece and, with God's grace, become saints. Join me, Annabelle Mosley, for Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. God bless you. Remember, you're never alone. God is always with you. Thank you for listening to a production of WCAT Radio. Please join us in our mission of evangelization. And don't forget, love lifts up where knowledge takes flight.